Hey, I'm Derek. And I'm Noah. You're listening to A Bite Of, where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession, no matter how upsetting they are, and enjoy it one nibble at a time. One. <laughs> Sad. Horrible nibble. The saddest nibble that ever was. Uh, all right. Well, no spoilers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> on how we feel about this before we get into this um status quo changing episode of x-men 97 episode five halfway through the show and they did this make sure you're following us subscribing leaving reviews joining the patreon emailing us at abonibbles at gmail.com all of those amazing ways there's so many ways whatever you fancy whatever you like just do do it. And then this month, oh yeah, we have a uh, Dead Boy Detectives. We have an episode coming out on that. <laughs> we got it early. <laughs> so next week, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. There was, there's so much going on. So next week we will have our review oh of gosh. Dead Boy Detectives mm-hmm. dropping when the series drops on Netflix. So DC and now we're talking about Marvel. Oh, best of both worlds. I mean... We're just doing it all here at a bite of, and of course, spoiler alert. Although I don't know how you don't know what happened on this episode. Can I, hold on, let's put pause on this for a second. Can we as a collective lovers of X-Men content, please like stop posting full clips at Three in the morning. <laughs> I see. I mean, I've made this this ask before. No one has listened. It seems like the more drama there is within the episode, the more clips immediately appear. So yeah. I just, if I go on any piece of social media, I'm just scrolling really quickly. Like yeah. Any sort of color that looks like X Men reminiscent, I am speeding past. Yeah, it's one of the downfalls of just going onto social media, and also the release times. I do wish it was releasing at like six p.m. and nine p.m. Kind of like how they did, what was it, Percy Jackson, they did that? And it was, everybody could watch it. Right. At once, at yeah, a reasonable it's time. bizarre. Us East Coasters, I ain't staying up until three. Yeah, it is weird that they're both Disney. Yeah. But they're, mixed, I don't know. I feel like at this point, they're just like, I don't know, how do you want to release they're it? They're just like, <laughs> just like, like, send, send. I don't know. Yeah, it's like two episodes and then they're like, mm, let's yeah, go. so bizarre. Okay. <laughs> anyway, spoilers ahead. Um, Tons. For this. Yeah. So. Let us officially take a bite of X-Men 97, Episode 5, Remember It, directed by Emmy Yonemura and written by Bo DeMeo. A pressing interview at the mansion leads to secrets being uncovered between Scott and Jean, and on Genosha, the past, present, and future collide, creating a cataclysmic tragedy. Mm. This was my original description that I wrote. <laughs> drama, 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 Nightcrawler, Ace of Base, Death. <laughs> I like that one much yeah, more. That was the one that I wrote immediately after watching it. I was like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. It was drama. It was sad. Nightcrawler was awesome. And they played Ace of Face. Yeah. I do feel like the, the interesting thing about this. So we usually release this on Saturdays, but, you know, we released our Fallout episode. So go listen to that. And it was a lot. So we took a little bit of time to process, which is a good thing. Right. <laughs> I've been dreading this. I know, me too. (laughs) And um, just because I feel like once we do an episode on it, it's real. And I'm like, can we just like not? Like, let's just wait. But. (laughs) Fuck, I forgot my train of thought. Oh, my God. What what did you just say? Oh, we've been dreading. I got it. I got it. Mm. I got it. It's just like lost it. But I do feel like there's like a lot of conversation about particular thing in this episode. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that happens in this that by the time you get to the end of it, that's all you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be fun to kind of pick our brains about this. Yeah. How do you feel about the episode? Give me your thoughts. So the interesting thing, watching it a second time, it was actually worse knowing it was coming. Right. Kind of leading up to that. But I actually felt a little clearer watching it this time. I think because I knew of the thing that was happening, it allowed me to kind of pay attention to the things leading up to it. So I think that there's a lot going on here, very much about the relationships between them, the interpersonal relationships. And I think that it actually leaves us, obviously, with this horrible tragedy. Um, 
after they've just dealt with the tragedy amongst them, I also feel like there's a bit of a question mark here about this attack and where it came from. Master mold and all that crap. Right. So which they it, thought they handled. That's what I mean. So we thought we handled that. We thought that they took care of these people. So now it's still going on. And so obviously this is going to be the driving force moving forward for the rest of the season. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do believe some of the creators had said like, this is like the turning point for the season. But apparently I wouldn't say like three episodes from now is like worse that they hinted. So I don't know what they mean by worse or like, like the episodes. So I guess we'll wait and see, but I think it, this is fantastic. I have no notes. Like I think what we're going to be doing now is more talking about the motivations and the characters and mm. stuff like that. And not really looking at it as a, like a, like a, Oh, they, this was a weird camera angle that they did. It's like, this is perfect. Like, I think this is the best the X-Men have been in a very long time, but I'm really loving it. And I mm. like that. They're still mixing that like old feel of soap opera because X-Men are a soap opera drama with family dynamics and relationships, but then having these things that are like, this is what the X-Men are about. Not mm -hmm. dying, but like, <laughs> these are the struggles they go through. Yeah. And all the allegories and everything that they represent. Yeah. Well, you know, that was one of the things that I thought a lot about, you know, thinking about war, thinking about genocide, but just even thinking about being the people, um, you know, as, as a gay married couple, right? Not to get too deep into it, but I think that it's interesting because there's this whole other layer of like how the outside views us in the sense of we're fighting for our rights. But at the same time, we're still human to human beings who have to work through daily trials and tribulations and work on our relationship. And so I think that's very representative here, especially in this episode between Scott and Jean, between Rogue and Gambit. Um, it's it's these people who are dealing with this bigger thing that's happening to them, but yet they still have to figure out who they are within that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this it's a it's a tough episode to watch in when you think about it that way. Right. It's like so many types of people, so many groups of people aren't safe in churches, schools and anything like that. So, like, it's a hard look and it's a hard to watch in that lens. Um but I, it's important, right? Because it shows that, yes, this is what happens and we need to put a spotlight on this. And that's the great thing about fiction, right? Is like we can have these characters with all these powers and stuff, but they mean something and we can kind of see ourselves in that. Mm. Um, before we get into like the really heavy parts of the episode towards yeah. the end, <laughs> let's talk about some of the heavy stuff in the beginning that's not as like super tragic. The like harp, the soap opera <laughs> portion. <laughs> yeah. So the episode opens up with Trish Tim. I can't, I can't with her. She, I was so surprised when I saw her in this because she has like her ethics have been kind of like Meh, with mm -hmm. journalism in the comics. And as soon as she came on the screen, Trish, stop it. Trish is there to get the scoop. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing is. else. It, it's like, this is supposed to be something of a good thing for the mutants. You know, Genosha is going to be added as a nation and everything. And she's like, you know what I want to do is um, just lay out all of your drama. She's like, everything. so how's your son? I can't. The whole Sorry, but it says you had a baby. I loved it though. Like I love this scene because it's like, it shows Cyclops in a lens that I think has been hard for people to see or haven't really seen um, because he's always touted as like that boy scout or mm. boring or, you know, the straight and narrow and stuff like that. But it's like, he, he can never be a boy scout because the world will never let him be one, mm. you know, and seeing him almost lash out in a way, which I think was justified Yeah, with her. She's like, Oh, you don't have kids. Well, I see that it's uh, Nathan Charles summers and they were born here. And the doctor said this and he's like, you know what? No, <laughs> I do want to say he kind of got her on a technicality because she's like, you and Jean gray had a baby. And he's like, well, actually we didn't, we didn't. Yeah. It was me and my girl, Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I think that he very much tries to be the perfect politician in a way. He tries. And, and show the face of, I am the, you know, upstanding mutant citizen. You know, I am here to lead. But in reality, you know, he's dealing with all these problems and she got to him. Well, and, and there's a part in this when, you know, if you look at him watching it a second time, I actually like was really watching him 
And it's a cool thing that they do with his body language where he's sitting there and just before she kind of gets to that Nathan question, he's sitting there with his arms crossed and he's kind of just like tapping his finger Mm. like on his arm. And it's like, he's uncomfortable. This isn't what he's normally is supposed to be doing. And then you find out it's like, I have to answer your stupid questions. I'm not like you. You'll never be like us. This is not, what are we doing here? It's great. I mean, I even think that we see how shitty it is during this interview when he first sits down and they're like, uh, buddy, your glasses are doing something weird to the light. So it's like nobody has done the research. Nobody has come in respecting them. They're just there because it was like sort of an opportune time when Genosha's is going to be part of the UN. Let's go talk to the X-Men. So you can see how he's he's fighting their prejudice and, and their disrespect while heading into this interview right and i think that a lot of people can unfortunately relate to that type of thing on a funnier and lighter note i did like that uh beast can blush so um oh. <laughs> what does he say blue blushes or something like that or <laughs> oh my i was like he's so cute yeah she worked her charms i'd say on beast and jubilee but didn't work so well well because what is she gonna have on them right and yeah. she she saw an opportunity just like this will make better TV. So yeah. let me pivot from this. In this whole scene, we do get this, the love square, love triangle almost, because so we see Jean reminiscing about her powers and Logan comes up and talks to her. And I always love their dynamic because Logan is like 95% of the time really respectful of Scott and Jean. And he does have that like resentment in his voice when he's like, you're Scott and Gene. It's just what it is. It's supposed to happen. Even though he doesn't like want it to happen, he understands. Yeah, it. he respects their relationship, sure. And even for Gene having to go through everything and work through everything and trying to figure out who she is and where she fits and what's real, she slips up, right? And she kisses Logan. And Logan was the great man that he was. And he's like, yeah, Gene, like, I don't think you mean to do that. Yeah, he's like, I can see you're processing a lot, standing in the middle of a river, but not getting wet, holding memory water bubbles or whatever you're doing. So you're not in your right frame of mind, baby. He's like, bye, bub. Let's just like take it back a little bit. Hearing what they think about um, or telling the story about uh, when she had the phoenix and Mm -hmm. holding back Scott's powers and hearing both of them talk about it is actually fantastic storytelling i really like that little detail Mm. that they did yeah i i thought it was really good to kind of seeing it from both of their perspectives him in the interview and her reliving it through uh talking to wolverine so you know there is they're going through something right although they're separate from each other they're obviously dealing with the balance of their relationship because you know i i think there's the bigger question of was scott cheating Okay, let's talk about this, right? Let's talk about the psychic rapport affair. Let's talk about all of that. I thought the psychic rapport was our thing. Yeah. (laughs) It is. Drama. To to be fair, it is. But I guess it's like also a part of her. So I don't know. Like also though, like you use your psychic rapport to like sit in your mind bedroom and talk to each other. Yeah, what are those things? I don't know. Call each other on the phone. You know, I, there's been a lot of discourse about this, right? Like, this person cheated, this person didn't cheat, this person, whatever. I don't blame either of them. I feel like there's so much going on. It's not black and white. Mm. Do I think that Scott maybe should have told Gene? Yeah. But, like, do I blame him for, you know, he's grieving his son. He did walk out on his son, just saying at the very end. He was like, I can't be a part of this and left. But I'm not going to hold that against him. He... He's going through a lot, right? He's grieving his son. And of course, he's going to gravitate towards the only person that understands that trauma. Mm -hmm. Do I think he should be like smooching her in his mind? Probably not. But like, talk to Gene about it. Yeah. Yeah. It it almost feels like modern times version of this is being in a new relationship, but still DMing your ex or something. <laughs> you know, like, like, I'm, I'm, like this much. Right, right, right. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's that's the obvious, that that's cheating in a way. Like, you know, depending on how deep those DMs are going. But right. this is very interesting because, you know, we don't know how long it wasn't Gene. So he was just living his life, falling in love with this person and creating a, a literal life with right, it in right. Nathan. And so... 
They got married. They you just said with it. With when you talked about Madeline, the clone. <laughs> I don't know. Apologies. I don't know how she identifies. Um, but so I I understand that. Like we went through so much trauma together. Right. But I do agree. Like maybe talking to her about it. But on the flip side of it, I could definitely see how Jean is upset. But also, you you just kissed. Well, and I think that it's all confusing, right? And Mm -hmm. I think from us looking in, we we can align like our moral compasses, right? It's like I wouldn't have done that. It's like, but you don't know, (laughs) you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you don't know what they're feeling because she's Jean's probably really confused because she is going through all her memories, right, and trying to piece together. So she's probably also piecing all together the Logan stuff as well, right? And she's like, I see as much of that now. You know, so it's very confusing. Yeah, you might say it's a Jean Grey area. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just all, the, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to, what to equate it to. I just keep going like, is it a Venn diagram? Is I, it a love trapezoid? I don't know what it is. At this moment, there's four involved, so it's just a, like a and love square. And one is a clone of the other one. I don't know. Are they one? Are they two different people? Whatever side you're on, it's great drama. This is like the mutant drama that I love. And yeah, I want. Yeah, I got to say, I'm not on anyone's side. I'm just an audience member at Jerry Springer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like. And the fact that like, so the really cool thing about this episode and what we're seeing is that it does seem like it's, it's kind of molding together a lot of eras of X-Men. We have Grant Morrison's X-Men, especially with like the affair stuff. And then like Krakoa, Jonathan Hickman era stuff even though genosha is in krakoa it does feel like it has some there's a gala there's like yeah it's not like full hellfire gala Mm. but it's like i guess a 90s version totally of it but so the cool thing about this is like this situation of like that like cheating and all of that stuff and when gene finds out in the comics it's emma frost in this like kind of situation but I liked in this that Emma was still involved or like knew what was going on because mm-hmm. Emma Frost making her entrance and then just like eavesdropping on psychic rapport affairs is amazing. Now, does Emma Frost have a psychic ability? Oh, yeah. What is her deal? She's very proficient in psychic oh, okay. ability. She is hugely proficient. In it. And then her secondary mutation is the diamond form, ah, which the in, diamond the, form. in the comics, the Genosha stuff that happens, that's when it comes about. So she might be getting her diamond form. Well, that would be cool. Yeah. Because we don't really know. I was just going to say, we don't know where she is right now. We don't know where a lot of them are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, connecting the two now, we also see that Jean and Madeline have a connection still, right? They, after this kind of blowout with Scott, where she finds out that he's psychic rapporting behind her back, her and Madeline are kind of getting this same bolt it's like they were psychically attacked in, in some way. I don't know if it was an attack or, or is if it, it was a warning. Something like that. Because in, I believe, one of the earlier episodes, we did see this. Mm-hmm. Gene saw this happening um, and then it was finally like put together. So I'm curious what's making her do that or if it's just her powers just innately doing it. Mm. Um, but the fact that both of them, who is technically the same person did that is very interesting yeah what did gene say he she's a like a chunk of her or a piece of her that was carved out well i think yeah it was more like a like an insult to scott but it was like he carved out a piece of me and you fell in love with it yeah but (laughs) i think that my point is is that there is that connection right right right. they are from the same being this episode does have some of one one of the best like not one of a lot of great one-liners yeah it really does towards the end of this like at the mansion conversation that we have when scott and gene in front of trish are fighting and talking about clones which is like great for tv but like bad for them to know uh, she tells him galaxies were beckoning me and i turned my back on them for you Whoa. because of those eyes i mean i i have to say is very romantic um there's some resentment happening and i think that they're doomed (laughs) i don't want them it's scott and gene like you always root for them but they're not they're not in good spirits right now it's jot yeah it's skeen (laughs) right (laughs) it's cyclops gray yeah whatever whatever they go by yeah (laughs) gene (laughs) clops yeah but i agree there are a lot of really good one-liners here Mm -hmm. from 
like everyone throughout the entire thing. And we started off with that little uh, beast quip about blushing, but it just kind of kept growing from there. I think one of my favorites, aside from the Scott interview, is when at the gala, when Magneto was talking to Dr. Cooper and she was like, you know, I didn't know that they would, um, you know, terrorists usually don't like run the nation or like leaders of the nation or whatever. And he's like, yeah, but usually they let they what did, what did they it say? It was something like um, he said, she said, like, I'm surprised they would elect a terrorist. There we go. To be their leader. And he goes, well, most countries let their leaders be terrorists. There we go. Something closer to that. Got to it. Yeah, it's not exact. <laughs> Don't like it's not an exact quote, but it's close. <laughs> Very good. I'm like, I like how my, one of my favorites was, I can't remember. <laughs> well, that's the problem <laughs> is that so many of things are so good that they're kind of mind blowing. And when you try to think about it and bring it back, you're kind of like that one. But when the thing happened, whatever. But I, but I can remember when my boy Kurt said, love is measured in forgiveness. Oh, I love him. Can, okay, let's get to Genosha. Let's, let's get to it. Let's fly to Genosha. And you know what? They said, what better ambassadors than the love triangle? <laughs> Let's send them in. Magneto, the terrorist, <laughs> Rogue, the soul sucker, and Gambit, the Cajun with an attitude. Like, what? Why were they the three that they said? It is an interesting mix, but, you know, for TV, we love it. <laughs> we need this tr- love triangle to be the ones going there, right? Yeah. What did you think about Genosha? Uh, Genosha looks like a party town. Um, I mean, I I don't know. how to, It felt like... Um, Rio de Janeiro during Carnival, mm-hmm. but, you know, full of mutants. Well, I think, it, yeah, they like have a big celebration. So it was very yeah. like festive. Yeah. At the time. I, I mean, I loved it, right? It looked like a utopic society for mutants that are typically looked at weird or don't even, you can't buy something at the store. Agreed. Yeah. And I, and I think that we have like a number of different kind of groups that are being represented here, right? So the X-Men are flying in. We have Callisto and her group hanging out. We also have, you know, see-through Bob or whatever. (laughs) Glob. Bob. See-through Bob. (laughs) You put respect on Glob's name. (laughs) Sprite is there, right? Girl who turns into bird. (laughs) Pixie. (laughs) I'm going to give him comics to read specifically with these characters in it because they're so good. Leech. I love seeing Leech happy. Stop. Do you know what Leech's powers are? Dying? <laughs> Talking adorably? I don't... He can su- su- suppress or dampen powers. Oh. Yeah. So will that be good for us? I mean, I don't know at this point of like how in control of them. I think he is in control of it because people aren't just like losing their powers around him. So I yeah. have a question. What? What does rainbow hair do? Don't know. She just asks me cool. that every time and I say, I don't know. Okay, rewind the tapes. <laughs> when have I ever asked? No, when no, we're watching. Oh, mm, <laughs> likely story. I want to know. She's gorge. But it's, it's, it's awesome seeing so many different mutants interact. I got so happy. I can't even put into words how happy I was to see Kurt, to see Nightcrawler being so full of joy and happy to see the X-Men that he knows. Ugh. I just, I love him so much. I loved his design too. So cool. It's almost like they, they updated it obviously, but it's like, if I remember correctly, a lot of his face was like really dark, Mm -hmm. um, but they kind of just made it the upper part this time is just cool. I like that little tweak. Yeah. It was, that's, that was my favorite part too, was really kind of where his facial features just come into the darkness outlined, outlined by the blue. It's very reminiscent of his power, Yes, right? He's kind of blending in, he's disappearing and he was just so happy and vivacious and 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 i think really portraying the point that genosha is such a safe haven right. for these people and he he you know he came in his powers looked amazing i love the sound design with his powers it just it was really cool it was showing again like oh this is one of your favorite x-men we're gonna give you like a good amount of time with them i hope we get to see more of them well you know that's what i was thinking is that i'm uh, I, I mean we know how it ends right with this whole episode, but now I feel like he can step in to be another X-Men who's at the front lines. Why? Because they lost some, the ranks are dwindling. Yeah. Derek is like, and I think that he is going to be (laughs) filled with rage and want to defend his people. Yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the X-Men handle this or what the X-Men look like. Okay. Let's, I'm going to say not well, (laughs) we're getting ahead of ourselves. (laughs) 
One of the really cool things in the Krakoa era, the Jonathan Hickman era of X-Men, is when they have their nation on their island, is the the governing body is like the quiet council or the, the council, right? And so in this, we have a very interesting mix of people that are going to be the leaders of Genosha. I think it's absolutely insane who's on the council, but that's kind of how it was in the comics as well. You have to have villains, anti-heroes, heroes on it to... I guess, have everybody's opinion <laughs> on there. Sebastian Shaw should never be anywhere near any type of leadership at all. And like, there he is, yeah, there making he is. decisions. And Emma does not know how bad he is yet, apparently. Well, she never will. Seeing Moira, I always forget that she could have a Scottish accent and does have a Scottish accent. So that was fun. And she's just a human. No. Well, that's what they said, right? They're like, why is this human here? They say that. she's She's not. I don't, I mean, she, she can, she like reincarnates uh, and stuff. It's very confusing. Um, Havoc's there. Um, that's uh, Banshee, Banshee. Banshee, Banshee. Sorry. Oh, dear. Sorry, they, they're loud. <laughs> yeah. I'm I like distraught. how you turn to the camera. I'm distraught. I know, I feel like we're just like not wanting to talk about I it. I don't want to talk about it, even though he was so fucking awesome. He was so cool. Who, Banshee? Gambit. Oh, I was like, Banshee died just and made us fall in love with him for four episodes and then they kill her in the fifth one anyway sorry um the council yeah the council no okay let's let's talk about what the council wants right so they want magneto to kind of lead but not if um rogue doesn't lead with him i love it we mean rogue i she deserves it she's a great leader she would i love her it's just so funny he's a chancellor she's a queen yeah. They're just making up whatever they want over there in good old Genosha. Yeah, because they can. Also, I want to talk about the the giant statues of Magneto and Professor X. That's really interesting. It feels a little um North Korea to me. <laughs> Jesus. It is. They have giant statues <laughs> well, of them there. I don't think that they decided that. I think that the people that wanted mutants to have a great place to live, they're like, these are the people that started it. Let's give him a statue. But the Professor X statue does kill mutants later. So that's poetic. <laughs> R.I.P. <laughs> All right. So um, the Gambit, Magneto, and Rogue situation. Rogue has a tough decision to make. I feel like this, this episode does have a lot of like gray error E Like, I can see why they would do it. Are they wrong? I don't think so. Would I, I do it? I don't know. I Yeah, I think... I'll, a lot of it is based in, oh no, it's it's so split down the middle between like emotions versus practicality. Right. Right. And so there's this idea of leading a nation. There's also this idea of who can touch her. You know, they do have a past, Magneto and Rogue. And, you know, at the end of the day, Gambit's just the perfect gentleman. Yeah. I mean, I Gambit and Rogue are perfect for each other. They belong together. And I think that it becomes very evident in the end that she does also choose right. Gambit. Um, it was interesting to see Magneto and Rogue's relationship prior, the one that they didn't want to talk about. And I think we needed that as viewers to understand what she's battling with and what she could potentially do agree to do. I was trying to think of a different word to use. Sometimes just go with the basics. <laughs> do agree to do. Well, I was saying that Gambit was the perfect gentleman in this in this situation. He said, I'm not going to be toxic man. Right. He if said that's what you decide. Sure. Exactly. He didn't throw a fit. He didn't throw any cards in her face. He said, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Well, Sherry, we'll be friends. Yeah. He said, but he did say he was like, I feel like he's going to break your heart. We'll be friends. I'll be here if you need me, <laughs> which is like, oh, man, if we couldn't love him anymore. He has to go out like a champ. I mean, do you remember just a couple of episodes ago when I was like, who's your favorite character so far? And I was like, Gambit. I love him. He cooks. He wears crop tops. He's a nice guy. <laughs> but that, okay. But with the X-Men, it's hard to have a favorite because stuff like this happens. <laughs> if Storm doesn't get her powers back in the next episode, X-Men 97 is just coming for me. I think we, yeah, I think Life Death Part 2 is the next one. So mm -hmm. Hopefully she does. Yeah, because um, she's got to get it together because they're in shambles. Yeah, well, so what I think is really funny, the structure of this episode. So we get to the gala, right? And after Rogue and Gambit have that conversation, um, we get Magneto and Rogue just full on 
dancing in the air, making out right in front of Remy. And it's like, that's like, that's like not nice. (laughs) No, it's not nice. But what is nice is that they went the extra mile to get Ace of Bases, Happy Nation, which fits so perfectly. Happy Nation. They're in Genosha. Everyone's happy. They have their new leaders. It was very sexy. The way that that song bleeds into the horror, horror, (laughs) the horrors that happen is phenomenal. Mm. Like sound design and just mixing that together. Because it was still happening when Madeline sees Camp uh, Campbell's. Oh my God. Campbell's soup. This episode has me distraught. (laughs) We're such a mess. She has her son Campbell's chicken noodle soup. (laughs) He came from the future. (laughs) But no, so (laughs) Cable (laughs) comes back from the future to warn them. And she realizes that it is, in fact, Nathan. (laughs) Yeah. And he's like, not again. Because... We have to think, did he try to warm them, warm them, the soup, has he tried to warm, <laughs> warn them prior? Maybe. Madeline Pryor. <laughs> this episode has forced us into delirium. This is the only way we can handle the trauma. We're losing it. Yes. <laughs> Cable does go back in time to warn his mother or just warn them. He happens to run into his mother. Um, I love that the OG, Chris Potter, that voice Gambit in the original series came back to voice ga- Gambit. Cable, dear God. And I'm just, I'm like, yeah, I'm <laughs> nodding along. I'm not even catching. I'm going to say this again. The OG voice actor of Gambit came back to voice Cable. Got it. There we go. Not even going to edit that together. Just <laughs> No, leave it. Yeah, I'm going to leave We're it. We're not perfect. Um, but it's just the the sound in this, the sound of the heartbeat, the abruptness of everything happening. I, oh, as soon as that bomb went off and it did that thing where it would show a second of it and intense, go black and then keep doing that. What? 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 Oh, it, it's like, fuck, that was cool. But dear God. The last, however long this you know, these final 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, something. The fact that there is no music, it's only the sounds of the Sentinels lasers and them fighting against them. It's so powerful. The way that they animate this fight, the obliteration of the mutants, the close-ups that they choose to do, the fact that Magneto is looking through his hand at Rogue Oh my gosh, it was phenomenal. It was, I, it's massive. It's like a massive thing that happens. It still felt so intimate in some of these scenes, even with Rogue and Gambit finding off the Sentinels together. I was like, oh, this is so fucking cool. And then I'm like, oh wait, no, this is bad. Like this shouldn't be happening, but it's so fucking cool that it's happening. And then we get like amazing moments of, for Gambit, of all of the mutants, right? And I I love that like, I hope we get more spotlights on some of the mutants that typically don't get spotlights like this. But the fact that Gambit, not knowing that Rogue chose him in the end, because right when those bombs went off, right before it, she's like, Magneto, thanks, but like, my heart, my heart's with him. Like, I can't do this. He right? was right. And he was right. He knew that he was, you know, it wasn't going to work, but he still protected everybody. He still was her teammate and they work so good together. So good. Oh, did you see when he made he powered up the scarf? <gasps> oh, yeah. So cool. He powered up the scarf and then made that thing explode before it hit everybody. He's so fucking cool. He's so fucking cool. I mean, even he just like, oh, they just made him so I, you know, I love Gambit, but they just made him even more lovable in this episode. He saves the Morlocks. He sacrifices he he throws the motorcycle at rogue to save her he does everything for everyone else ultimately sacrificing himself for those that can survive on genosha and in such like a badass way it's like oh no i'm not eliminated yet also my name is gambit remember it (gasps) make the whole thing light up all he just put all of his energy into that oh so fucking cool it was it was like this moment of accepting that this is your end but But facing it with bravery yeah and he did he really did and so did magneto 
I mean, you you had mentioned the scene where you see him through his own fingers, and you also see Rogue looking at him through that tiny crack. He was saving them, trying to save the people that were with him, having Leech, and he told Leech that he would protect him, and he'd take him to safety, and he tried. He tried so much. And then, uh, to make it even more sad, in his language, told him, do not be afraid. And it just, like, is so sad because... You could see almost like, is that something that his parents also said to him when they were perishing? You know, it's just, it's very sad. Right when the Sentinels are landing and he's first really ramping up to go against them and throwing the monorail at them, we see him have flashes to his childhood, to his past, to being in a concentration camp. And he said, they will be revenged, avenged, excuse me. And again, it's that parallel of that genocide of being part of a group that is being attacked and being tried to wipe out for whatever hateful reason, here he is again. Yep. But now he is old enough to defend them. Well, he has the abilities now, right, right, to hopefully stop it. And in the end, he did. He did help stop them, and he saved countless n- a number of lives. Um, that monorail, though, using it as like a whip, an extension of himself. Oh, my God. When that three-headed Godzilla Sentinel type thing was about to blast them and then he knocks it at the top of the head. I just, there's so many cool scenes. I could, I, I feel myself wanting to watch it again just mm. to see those moments. But then I remember like how devastating it is. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know and if I want to. How about her clutching yeah. his dead body saying, yeah. I can't feel you. Going to black before she finishes that sentence. Savage. If there's one thing they were doing, they were serving drama in this episode and they succeeded. Nasty. Tens across the board. Nasty work. The first time that she's ever able to feel him and she can't feel him. It's because there's nothing there to feel. (laughs) His life is out of his body. Mm, He didn't look so good. Okay. So what are they going to do? I know. Okay. Well, so this, we're going to work through it. We're going to talk about it. Right. Okay. I need to talk about this to my therapist this week. (laughs) You could. (laughs) So, I mean, amazing scenes aside, very sad scenes aside, right? We're left with the mutants had a nation that was approved by the United Nations to become its own nation. It was attacked. It was a happy nation. Yeah, it was attacked within like, I don't know, a week of it opening. Um, A lot of them died. But we have Cable. He knows what happened, right? He tried to save them. Maybe he body slid too late Mm -hmm. in that particular scene. Let's kind of talk theories here a little bit. I think now we're at the point in the season where we're introduced to this. The story is laid out. This is what's happening. What do you feel like is going to happen with the rest? Because we have five episodes left. There's a lot left. Yeah. So it feels to me that this is not the first time that Cable has tried to do this. I think that they are going to have to take a new tactic and it almost seems like he might have to slide earlier to much more before this. And I believe that Jean and Madeline are going to work together to in some way stop this from happening. Right. Right. Also, we need more uh, Omega level mutants, right? Mm -hmm. I do love the Sentinels every time they're like Omega level mutant detected. I'm like, yes, they are. Well, when, you know, they, we have that final scene with Magneto, it says Omega level threat eliminated. Yeah. And then it turns around. It's like, bye, (laughs) going to get more. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But I, I do think, you know, with time travel involved and we, we saw like the time bracelet Bishop is nowhere to be found. I'm hoping that they do fix it do i want them to just do something as simple of you know cable goes back to when they first were destroying all of those sentinels and everything and like make sure all of it's done do i think that's easy yes but i could see that happening and and something like that right because do you really think that they're gonna keep magneto dead gambit dead all of those countless mutants dead I don't know. I hope not. Like, what does it look like after right. that, right? I mean, or maybe this is just such a devastating thing that it forces them to come together, even though that they have these deep fissures within their personnel foundations. Yeah, I don't know. Like, hmm. Like, do you feel like if they were to reverse it and then 
like at the end of the season, do you feel like that's too quick and it lessens the stakes or the impact or I, I think that within this season, we're not going to get the, we're not going to finish. I almost wonder if in that last episode, we're going to hear mon chéri and we're all going to be like, "Ah!" and flip tables because he's back in some way. (laughs) I just appeared out of a portal. Right, exactly. You know, and Cable's like, okay, goodbye. Um, I am curious if this in some way is going to mix with Mr. Sinister. No, we would have to. Right, because right that was like, he just disappeared again. So when is he going to come back into this? So that's my question. Yeah. Is Forge, you know, is Storm going to get her powers back and then Forge is going to create something for them to fight? The Sentinels, you know, I mean, I don't give two shits about the Sentinels, though. Like, I want them. I want the characters you're locked back. Like, I want them back. You know what I mean? (laughs) But there's a new army that they're going to have to destroy. Yeah, yeah, I do. I want them back. The the size of that thing. Massive. It had little tiny regular size Sentinels just dropping. Well, I was. So is the is the beetle thing that was dropping little Sentinels. That's not the same as the three headed one. I, you know, I'm not too sure. Was it two I think it was. One's a carrier. No, I think it was oh, the okay. same thing. Maybe. I think, I don't know. I don't know. Guys, help us out here. Did you see it? I was, I was crying. It was hard to see. <laughs> I don't know. This, you know what? They've left us with a lot of questions that we need answers to. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited to see where this goes. Mm. Um, I'm very much enjoying this show. I want more, but also... Don't hurt anymore, please. What's kind of hilarious to think about is that we were watching episodes, maybe not this emotional, but in the original X-Men animated series when we were like 10. Also, like, but we waited like almost 30 years for them to just kill I'm, most of them. I know I said this already, but they literally made us fall in love with Gambit in yeah. four episodes it to was, kill him. It was really smart because I don't think anybody would have expected it. Because Gambit's amazing. I think everybody loves, has some like for him. But I don't think we expected this to happen. And it was very smart on their part. Like, oh, let's like, let's focus on Gambit a little bit to kill him. <laughs> no more Gambit muffins. But Lenore Zan, she killed it in this episode. Rogue, mm. you know, she, give her her flowers. She's killing it as Rogue again. Ugh, anyway, okay. Final thoughts. What is there to think when there is no longer happiness in the world? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it was an incredible episode. It really was. As, although it was in, so devastating, I think that's what made it as good as it was. They did not hold back on the sound. They didn't hold back on the animation. They didn't hold back on the storyline. No. And what's funny is that uh, this is the longest episode out of the season so far. And in the first half of it, I was kind of rolling my eyes going like, oh, my God, this is like so heavy handed in the silly drama. But it was leading to a place. Um, and so they they made me feel a little too comfortable and then pulled the rug directly out from under me. Well, it's smart, right? It's mm-hmm. like this is the familiar part. And I do feel like it has this cool two sided head of the coin where it's like the Trish Tilby interview is very much like old x-men mm. and then the genosha stuff is this new x-men that we're getting um with the animation and how the fights are and all of that so i i loved it i love the structure of it i think it's beautiful i think it was devastating to have the mutants at the mansion see all of their people and not know who died or what's happening but just seeing their people being hunted again being killed and they're powerless to stop it because it happened they had to do a fucking interview and while that was happening all their people and and the question of how many can't even be answered right (gasps) i loved it 10 out of 10 i (sighs) think this is one of the best things that marvel has produced in a long time i know i've said that but it just keeps happening Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know every episode gets better and better um i'm excited yeah renew this for a couple more seasons definitely if they can get live action x-men to be like this Man, a big ask, man, a big ask. But I think you need to hug your loved ones, grab a can of Campbell's Cable noodle soup and just, you know, 
hang out with your good friend see through blob or whatever it is. What's glob. It? Glob. 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 Gob? Glob. Glob. <laughs> I said that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let us know what you thought yeah, of the episode. Below. We'll see you next week uh, with some dead boy detectives. Yeah. Woo. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go to sleep. <laughs>